So um, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Turwin. We all met him on the boat earlier in the year. So I, I am currently the head of the upper school at Chase Collegiate, which might seem incongruous with a marine biologist, but part of my interest to get back to the East Coast was to continue the research that I'll tell you a little bit about today. While I was at Maryland, I studied blue crabs in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, the sort of overarching interest that I have is coastal ecology and really how people interact with the coast, which then can have an impact on coastal systems. So in uh, Chesapeake Bay, I looked at little juvenile blue crabs and they like to use the little shallow shoreline areas as a refuge. So they go into the shallow water and hide because they're cannibalistic and the larger blue crabs actually will eat the smaller blue crabs. So the smaller blue crabs would go into the shallow areas to hide, they'd come out at night feed and go back into the shallow areas. Well, has anyone been on the coast with, when there's development? So you're driving along the coast and there's subdivisions or people that have houses right on the water? What do they sometimes do to the shoreline? Hmm? Yes. <laughs> what do they sometimes do? Yes, they do. But what might they do? What might they do to the shoreline? They'll destroy it. They might destroy it. They might have a lawn that they try and maintain. So they alter that slope, that nice little shallow slope, and then that took away space for these little juvenile crabs to hang out. So again, looking at the interface between people and the coastal environment. I then did a postdoc at UConn where we looked at uh, the fouling community, sea squirts, um, what else do we have, sponges, mussels, all those different things, and then looked at a, a climate change issue to see how climate change then could interact with invasive species to then shift an ecosystem. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Hopefully, you try to slog through that paper. Uh, in a scientific paper like that, you can use the abstract, which is the first part of the paper, sometimes in bold, sometimes set aside. What the abstract is supposed to do is give you an overview of everything that's in the paper. Gives you a smidgen of background, gives you a smidgen of methods, and then sort of lays out the conclusions and then usually ends with a big, a big doozy that, that sets up the work to make you excited to read the rest of the paper. So after you read the abstract, you were excited to read, you were pumped, right? And so you'll see some of the figures, some of the data throughout the presentation. The presentation should be easier to stomach than the paper. But what I wanted you to see is what an actual scientific paper looks like. That paper then gets used by different people. It might get used by managers as they try and, and manage a fishery. It might be used by lawmakers. So this paper could be cited for climate change research or if they're trying to limit carbon emissions, they might cite this paper and say, as climate changes, ecosystems change. So this paper lands in a whole bunch of different places. So I wanted to see an actual basic research paper and that's what that is. So we'll have time to talk about that at the end. We will end with you doing an activity for me. I need your help to design an experiment that will continue this research. And so I'll put you in smaller groups and get you moving around in case you doze off, which I'm not saying you will, but in case you do, um, then we can do that. Really? <laughs> I'll learn more about that soon. So uh, anytime you give a talk, first tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. And so uh, what we're going to hear about today is we're going to look at global climate change, big picture stuff and we're going to connect it to invasive species and how those things interact. We're going to use a case study using a population in Long Island Sound which focuses on these little sea squirts and so the key message I want you to remember is that a small change in climate, a small change in temperature in this case can have a huge impact in an ecosystem. And so sometimes you see oh it's only a half degree over the next decade or it's only a degree over the next couple decades and you think not bad, right, if it's 79 or 80. I'm still comfortable in my tank top walking around, right? But what you need to understand is a small change can have a huge impact on ecosystems, okay? And so that's where we will, we will head. So global climate is warming. You might debate what's causing it, how, how it's manifest, where we can measure it. You can debate all those things. But we know it's recorded that global climate is warming. The recent upward uh, temperature trend is unique. We haven't seen anything like it historically. The speed of the, the rate of change is, is unprecedented. And we can also look for specific patterns such as extreme lows that can then have an impact on an ecosystem. So we can't just look at the average temperature change. We have to pull out, is it, is it how cold winter is, how hot summer is, and look at those different patterns. And again, we're going to then look at a specific example 
from an invasive species, again, this little diplosoma, little sea squirt, to look at the relevance there. Okay, so here's some data, just in case you didn't believe me, that global climate is warming. So this is from uh, 1860 down, a data set from the uh, Climatic Research Unit, which interfaces with the International uh, Commission on Climate Change. And what they do is they set a zero bar, and then you look at anomalies. So who knows what an anomaly is or what the word anomaly means? Give me something. If something is anomalous, is it something that happens every day? No. What is it then? Something that doesn't happen every day. Something that doesn't happen every day. So a deviation from the norm or the average. So if something is anomalous, it doesn't happen all the time. So you're awake, that might be an an anomaly of how you typically approach this class. If you want to right? believe in its being. Right. <laughs> so, here we have, we can see historically, and then as we get into the last uh, few decades, we see this temperature pattern where the anomalies are typically in the positive. So we have a significant trend of temperatures that are consistently over what the historic average temperature is, and they're significantly over, okay? So what is causing this is, is somewhat debatable, but what is contributing to this and what reinforces this pattern is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. What does that mean? Did you fill your greenhouses with it? Traps the, light. Traps the light. lets the light with the heat energy through, reflects off the earth, and then, and then works like an insulating blanket. And so it can reinforce temperature changes and increase the heat that's retained in the system. So as CO2 increases, then we can see that the global heating occur as well. And you notice the blue lines, have we had a lot of variation in CO2? Historically, this goes back 400,000 years, so pretty rich data set. Yeah. So we've had a lot of variation, right? We've had times where it's been quite high, times where it's been quite low, and it's oscillated. Where are we now? Yeah. We're like crazy off the, the chart. Did you see the inconvenient truth? See that film by uh, Al Gore? He walks around a bigger screen and wears the lapel mic as well. Anyone see that? to track what happens when he wants to go and show how high CO2 is. Do you remember what he gets in? It's like, isn't that over the, the monitor? It is like, it's really yeah, he gets on like a cherry picker, a little crane, and hops in. It's very dramatic, right? If I had one, I could go up like this high, and then I'd be up here. And do that. <laughs> right so he gets on this crane, and it, and it takes him up. And, and what he's trying to demonstrate is this is unprecedented. This is new territory for CO2. What are some things that contribute to CO2 in the atmosphere? Cars. Car. We're burning fossil fuels. Emissions from that include carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. And so industrial revolution is implicated. Our increased fossil fuel use, all those things say we're getting up there. And we can see the temperature is varying as well. Does it look like they co-vary? Is one varying as the other one does? Okay, yeah. so that's sometimes referred to as a correlation. Does that mean that CO2 changes are causing the change in temperature? Is correlation always a causation? No, they could just be changing together. And one of the complicating factors and why I say it's a positive feedback, have you learned about positive feedback in AP Bio yet? What's the greatest example of positive feedback that's always taught, I'm gonna predict, it's always taught in AP Bio? pH in the blood. pH in the blood, is that negative, positive? Is that regulated or does it increase and keep increasing? Oh, it's regulated. Okay, little baby, Did we talk childbirth? My favorite examples. <laughs> so we're not going to go through birds and the bees. But labor, pushing out the baby, the, the pressure creates stronger contractions and the baby comes out. So it's a positive feedback system. So in this case, as temperature warms, why might increasing temperature increase CO2? Think oceans. So this is kind of an AP bio story. Yeah. No, you might as you increase temperature, have increase evaporation. Think about gases. Cold water, warm water hold more gas. Cold water. Cold water can hold more gas. Correct. So as the oceans warm, what is happening? Water's getting warmer. Can it hold as much CO2? So the CO2 that is dissolved is what? Release. Release. It's outgassing. So as oceans actually warm, they release CO2. So now you've got this complex system where CO2 contributes to warming. And then the warming contributes to more CO2, and so you get this positive reinforcement, which is why we probably are seeing this acceleration of global climate change. 
Okay, so the presence of CO2 is impacting the system. We can all agree on that. All right, but I mentioned it's not just a global average we want to pay attention to. We actually can look at different patterns of temperature change in these anomalies. And even within the United States, we can, we can look at a pattern in the summer and a pattern in the winter. We're going to be looking at Long Island Sound, so let's focus on Connecticut. Can we all find Connecticut on the map? <laughs> so let's start in the summer. Nice and toasty. Here's Connecticut. What color is it? White Connecticut. And so what does that say about the temperature change? Not too much. If you looked at average summer temperatures, we're actually holding pretty steady. Okay? What about winter? So let's find Connecticut again. Way up there. Now it's sort of a lovely rustish orange color. What does that mean? Warmed up. So the anomalies are actually in the positive in the winter. So we're experiencing warmer winters, even if our summers are still sort of holding steady, our winters are warmer. And it turns out that's the key piece for this little invasive critter we're going to talk about. Okay? So it's not just a global average. You have to look at more specific patterns. This is some data that we'll use as we look at Long Island Sound. And these are uh, water temperature data points from uh, Millstone uh, Nuclear Power Plant, a northeast utility plant down near, uh, in Milford, near Groton. And so they collect data when they take water in. And this is then long-term data for um, the winter water temperatures in Long Island Sound. Trend line shows there's a positive relationship, so the water has been getting warmer. Is that, are you guaranteed you're always going to have a warmer winter? No, part of the great thing of this data set is all the variation. So we have some low years, we have some high years, but in general, we see it trending up. Okay, we all buy that? It's not the cleanest data, but we're okay with it. I have any statistician people in here? Anyone in stats? Going to challenge any of my stats? Feel free to jump in. <laughs> and if you have questions about anything, please ask as we go. All right, so if we think about what might happen if, if temperature increases, what's going to happen in Long Island Sound or what happens in marine communities? So some of the general things you might have heard about relate to sea level rise. So as the uh, climate warms, why does sea level rise? One obvious answer and one not so obvious answer. So why might sea level rise as the climate warms? Yep. Ice is melting. So we've heard about the polar ice caps. We've seen the dramatic footage of ice breaking and falling in the water. And we feel bad. We see polar bears swimming. See that polar bear they tagged? And it swam like 3,000 miles. It's a crazy story. The cub died. It was tragic swimming. So the ice is melting. And so that ice melting adds liquid to the uh, oceans and sea level rises. Correct? And that's, that's one reason. What's another reason? Sort of analogous to our little gas story we told a second ago. What's another reason sea level's rising as the climate warms? Precipitation. Mm, maybe the global weather patterns are changing, but if we think net precipitation across the, the globe is still the same, that wouldn't change it. What else? Warmer liquids have a greater volume. Excellent. So what happens as you warm things? He said warmer liquids have a greater volume. So as things warm up, they okay. expand. So as you warm the oceans, you outgas CO2 and you expand volume. It's called thermal expansion. So just the warming of the ocean then increases sea level because the water's stretching out. Okay, so well, the, the uh, rate of, of increase, about two to three millimeters per year. We've actually lost some islands. Did you know that? There are actually some islands that existed maybe when you were born that are now gone <laughs> as sea level rises. So small, uh, Increases in sea level, depending on the setup of the shoreline, can have a huge impact. If you have a nice steep shoreline here, then a, a given increase of sea level may not have a huge impact. The things that are up here are still fine. Marsh sort of buffers that and you're fine. On Long Island Sound, where we have a, uh, near the coastal uh, rivers, where we have these coastal plains, then a given sea level rise may then en encroach pretty far onto land, have a huge impact on the coastal areas. So in Long Island Sound, we're closer to this in a lot of areas, and so sea level rise could have an impact. Okay, what about creatures? Got to have an excuse to put creatures on there. So, sea level rise we talked about. What about commercially important species? Lobsters? Anyone pay attention to the lobster story lately? Connecticut lobster. Lobster fishermen and women, do they enjoy Maine lobster? Why? Why not? What's going on in, in Connecticut right now with lobster? Having town meetings about it? 
There's not as many of them. So they're actually considering a moratorium. Lobster uh, catch rates are way down. They're worried about the lobster population. And so now they're looking at what might be causing this. Could temperature stress have an impact on lobsters? If warm water can't hold as much gas, what's one important gas to lobsters? Oxygen. oxygen. So if the dissolved oxygen in the sound is going down because temperatures are going up, that might impact lobsters. Also, the, the stress from that may impact the ecosystem in a way that then they can't get food. We'll see invaders that might be stealing food from them. So lobsters are, are maybe feeling the impact. Ground fish, this is one of the uh, studies where they actually looked at water temperature and found that warmer uh, winter water temperatures actually result in lower survivorship of eggs and larvae. So nice um, commercially important species winter flounder. Okay, so a couple examples where climate change might be important. But where my love is, is on uh, alien species. Alien species we use just to sort of indicate that they came from somewhere else. And we get to use the Marvin the Martian little graphic, which is exciting for everyone, I can tell. <laughs> What else could you call these? If we didn't call them alien species, not everyone calls them alien species. What else could you call them? Foreign, Foreign species. What else? Invasive. Invasive species. We'll see. That's what I prefer for this talk. What else? Anyone? What if you purposefully brought those? So you bring in, you say, I love this uh, crazy um, snake mouth fish, which happened in Minnesota. This is the greatest snake mouth fish I've ever seen. And I have it in my aquarium. Oh, it's too big. It's eating all my other fish. Maybe it's from Thailand originally, but it's eating all my fish in my tank. What am I going to do with that snake mouth? I don't want to kill it. I don't flush it down the toilet. That's cruel. I imported it all the way here. It's kind of a friend. Throw in the lake. And now you've introduced the species into the lake. So introduce species. Some are purposeful. We bring in species that we want to introduce and others are accidental introductions or uh, ornamentals that then we release. So we'll see all kinds of different words for that. Sometimes you'll see non-indigenous. So the species that were there originally are indigenous and then non-indigenous, okay? But these are species that weren't always there. And so we're not saying that these uh, species arrived because of climate change. The, the change in climate didn't bring those species there, but the presence of the altered climactic conditions might help them stay established. Okay, here's a little trivia, keep everyone on your toes. Guess the economic impact, this is a study from 2000. The economic impact in the United States alone of introduced, invasive, non-native, whatever you want to call them, species. Everyone ponder, think of a number. Economic impact for a year due to these species. Hmm. First guess over here somewhere, you sir? Uh, Gotta start somewhere. 250 million. Pretty beefy, right? I wouldn't mind having that. 250 million. Okay, do we want to go higher or lower? Higher. Higher. It's like card sharks. Have you seen that show? It's yeah. terrible. Okay, we're going higher. You're correct. 250 million. So go give me another guess higher than 250 million. 400 million. Just checking. So 400 million? Okay, we want to go higher or lower? Higher than 400 million. Yes, we'll go higher. Another guess? And we won't do this all day. Thank you. Yep, another. A billion? Okay, yeah. a billion? Feel like higher or lower than a billion? Lower. Uh, now it's higher than a billion. Billion too. <laughs> Significantly higher than a billion. $122 billion per year. Estimated, there's a whole bunch of different studies that give some range, but it's always in the billions. And this one's cited often. $122 billion. Okay, so we think about invasive, invasive species. Now, where might they impact the sound? What kinds of things in the sound that we get might be impacted by invasive species? What would be an economic? So lobsters. So if there's an invasive species that affects lobsters, that's a significant cost. What else? Winter flounder. Winter flounder. Where did you come up with winter flounder? <laughs> I'm an oceanographer. He's an oceanographer. <laughs> Aspiring. You saw some of these things on the boat, right, when we were pulling them out? Those skates, those crazy skates. We had a lot of skates on that. Hey, what else? What other things? Don't you think of just things you catch and eat. What other things might be impacted? I heart sea squirts, but we're not ready to do much of those. How might they have a negative impact? So they grow on, on the surfaces of things. So you are wearing your tank top again, and you're in your cool boat, and you're out cruising Long Island Sound. And you're like, man, I'm buying a lot of gas. 
What's up with, why do I have to buy so much gas? Why won't my boat go easily through the water? What might be happening? Algae. Algae or? Sea squirts. sea squirts. Or sea squirts are growing <laughs> on the bottoms of things. So they're called fouling organisms. They actually grow on things and that can impede boat travel, uh, the, the power plant. What did I say? They take in water. That's where they measure the water temperatures. What happens to those intake pipes? They get clogged with things. We'll see a picture of zebra mussels, a huge problem. So there's all kinds of different impacts that, that species might have in Long Island Sound. Some other fun invasive examples, some terrestrial ones, the brown tree snake. Anyone heard of that story? It shows up in the AP test every now and then. Brown tree snake. Anyone know where it was introduced? We've all heard of snakes, right? Have you covered that yet? So brown tree snakes, introduced in Guam. Guam had no snakes. They came over in crates, in airplanes, during the war. And they get out. So birds, birds have no experience with crazy snakes that eat birds and eat their eggs. So the snakes are basically just cruising around the birds, like, hey, look at that, hey. It's a long, slithery thing, what's up? And then they eat their babies. I'm like, what? I don't know what you are. Like, they don't know to fly away. They've never seen a snake. So the brown tree snake almost completely eradicated whole groups of birds in Guam because there was no defense. It's an introduced species. They don't evolve together to have that sort of arms race. Uh, Africanized hon honeybees brought in to hybridize with bees in the Americas, trying to you know, ramp up our honey production. They're nasty, they're aggressive, they kill other bees, and they don't make very much honey. It's a bad decision. <laughs> Emerald ash borer, a little beetle that cruises through ash trees. And, and kills the trees. I grew up in a neighborhood that had ash trees all over the place. My mom still lives there. I was just back. They had to cut down all the ash trees. All gone. Because the emerald ash borer. So, introduced species can have a, a significant impact. Zebra mussels we mentioned. Freshwater systems the Great Lakes coated with zebra mussels. Huge impact. Uh, in estuarine systems, this marsh grass called Phragmites, which grows, creates a monoculture. We'll hear that a couple times. Say what's a monoculture? One culture. One culture. So in the case of Phragmites, you go to the Phragmites area, what do you see? Just Phragmites. Just Phragmites. Say Phragmites. It's, Phragmites. It's, it feels good to say it. It's a good word. <laughs> Phragmites. So you have a monoculture. Nothing really uses it. And so it's, it's not a, a great ecological um, component of the, the system, but it, it creates monocultures. In Long Island Sound, anyone go along, roll little rocks, look along the shore? Yeah, yeah what do you see? Crazy little crabs, right? There's a few that scurry about. Yeah. Uh, the, the crab you used to see sometimes in the intertidal are green crabs. They were introduced from Europe in the late 1800s called Carcinus manus. And they were um, sort of exploding along the East Coast. More recently, in the late 80s, early 90s, this other uh, shore crab called the Asian shore crab, Hemigrapsis sanguineus, has moved in. It's uh, about an inch across on its carapace, crazy aggressive, cruises all around, and they are voracious predators, they eat anything smaller than them. And so they are now about 90% of the crab community, if you go in the intertidal and roll rocks, you find Hemigrapsis sanguineus. They weren't even here a couple decades ago. So that quickly they've shifted the whole uh, coastal ecosystem, and so invasive species can, can be important. Oh, look at that. If you ever give a talk, always include a picture of yourself. And when you're younger and have more hair. So there we go. <laughs> so this is a, a picture. I'm holding a, a settlement panel. And on that uh, settlement panel are fouling organisms. Sponges, sea squirts, algae, um, all kinds of different things. Mussels that grow on this panel. The green has been highlighted to show you this little critter we're going to talk about, Diplosoma. And so that's on the, the panel. But we see all these different things typically grow on uh, the surface in Long Island Sound. Here's what a panel looks like. Very elaborate uh, experimental system. This PVC, the plastic, um, that's about 10 centimeters square. It's on a, a PVC pipe and strapped on there with a, a cable tie. And then those are hung in the water. Hung in the water for a week. And then every week the panels are pulled up. You look at them with a microscope and you count all the little baby critters that landed on there. That measurement is called recruitment. Recruitment into a marine population says new individuals that are added to the population. So we use these panels to estimate recruitment and that's one of the key uh, data points that you'll see and that you saw in that paper that I'm sure you noticed. Oh, just, oh, that's nice, right? So you're diving around, this is what you see. 
That's a typical fowling community. This is called uh, Bugula. This, this pretty little bryozoan, feathery. This guy up here, sea squirt. They've got the two siphons. They take water in one and blow water out the other. They filter out the food. And so it's a nice uh, little diverse community there. Um, what we see is as the invaders come in, there's a, a variety of sea squirts that are invasive species. These little guys here are called Molgula. And then this is a, a colonial tunicate that grows more like a carpet, sort of covers thing. This is called Botryloides violaceus, and, and it's got the orange color there. So those are both introduced species. But what I'll show you now, so you don't have to listen to me for a minute or two. I'll try not to talk as they play. Are two video clips from the USGS where they uh, show some of the different sea squirts. Ooh, underwater. So those are rocks covered in fouling organisms. The white is a colonial tunicate. It's very similar to Diplosoma. You can see it kind of peeling off the rock there. You see all the little siphons where it pumps water in and out. Soothing if you just let it wash over you. Blood pressure drops. You can see it kind of covers everything and is almost kind of dripping off. So if you were some other creature that either needed sunlight, like that plant, or in a muscle that needs to pump water, what's going to happen when you get all covered over? Gonna You're going to die. Not happy times. <laughs> so what is unique about these colonial tunicates that they can grow in a significant way, in, in a high rate, and then just drip off and coat things. So this is a underside of a, a dock or a series of floats, and this is all a colonial tunicate hanging down. This is, this is called, uh, I think this is a didemnid um, that's now invaded the east coast and the west coast of the United States. So you see it's all just kind of hanging and drippy. Not as soothing, not as calming, but still pleasant, I guess. Is anyone dove in Long Island Sound? Not a one? Part of my job at UConn as a postdoc was to dive into and to catalog underwater things, and so I had about 280 dives in two years. So it was a good job. So if you're looking for something to do, <laughs> not as fun as being head of a private school. <laughs> All right, so that gave you a sense of sort of what the, what the, um, how the, the creatures can grow, and so now let's look at some of the uh, data associated with this. Think a little more about ecology. Okay, so here's two, two species. Batrillus is a native species. That's a dark one you can kind of see. It also grows in this sort of carpet. And then Botryloides is the invasive species. They're very similar. So what attributes in this system where you're growing on a structure, what attributes might make an invader successful? What would make you a good, so you're going to be the top invader in your league? What traits might you have? Hmm? Less competition. So if there was less competition from other things, so if, if other things were, were kept fewer, then you might have more success. What else? Yep. Pardon me? Okay, so if you can reproduce faster. So you can start your reproduction earlier in the season. So you come out of the winter, and everything's just perking up, and then you start pumping out babies before everybody else. Okay, start your reproduction sooner. That's a great one. Fewer competitors, start your production. What else? Just a couple periods. Yeah. Yeah. You're nervous. I was going to have to talk really fast. Yeah. Be able to eat <laughs> stuff that's already there. Be able to eat stuff. Utilize the resources that are there. So you have to be able to uh, utilize the things that are available in this new system. What else? Pumping out babies is important, but these are holding space, so what might you want to be able to do? Grow. grow. These are colonial. They have, they're made of sort of multiple individuals stuck together. So you grow. So faster growth is going to help you take and occupy space. So imagine if you can get there faster and you can grow faster. You're going to dominate, right? And so that's, that's what we'll see with uh, Diplosoma. Okay, so here's our data set again. And this is the section where we have those panels hanging at, at University of Connecticut out in the water. They've been checked every week for now 20 years, but at this time 10 years. 
So this nice ongoing data set of the community. And so within this period, again, what's great about this data? It's not all the same. It's not, the same. It's not just a, a specific trend. So after a very cold year, we have a very warm year, and we have a lot of variation. So we'll be able to test our theory not only with the higher um, temperature years, but also the cool years. So when we dump all the data and we compare invasive species to the native species, we see what's called an interaction in statistics, where the trend lines go in opposite directions. Okay, so what happens with, with invaders as temperature is increased? What's the trend say? So this is what? Total recruits. What does that mean again? Like new stuff, new guys. New individuals into the population. So total recruits, we count them on that panel, remember? So as it gets warmer, what do we see with recruits of invaders? More recruits. They increase. So the warmer it is, the more recruits we have. Okay, so now what about for natives? opposite so as it gets warmer in the winter you actually see fewer native recruits okay data is a little messy again but it is a significant interaction where this one is trending up and this one's trending down so natives and, and invaders seem to respond differently to temperature but the, the, it, it was clean but not quite as clean as, as what we were seeing on the panels we knew there was more to it so when we focus on this one nasty green snotty sea squirt, Diplosoma listerianum, and look at, look at its growth. It has these times where it's absolutely dominant in the community. So here it is sort of growing all around. Is this orange guy a native or a invasive? Remember? The bright orange one? That was invasive. That was Botryloides violaceus. So these are two invaders that are, you know, dominating the panel. What's happening here? This is like a vase sea squirt styella, which is also an invader. And it's covered in diplosoma, that shiny green, like the shirt over there. Everyone look over at the shirt, wave. Mm -hmm. Or your tie. Diplosoma, or my tie, a little diplosoma-esque. And so it overgrows things. So now we look at the impact of temperature on diplosoma, which is a nat nasty creature. When you break it open, it's got a really low pH, nothing eats it. It grows really fast. And this is what we see. So now we have recruits again, but what does the scale look like? So we go from 0.1 all the way up to 10,000, so log scale here. And then down here, we have our mean winter temperature again. And what do we see? Who can capture that in, in brilliant prose? What pattern do we see? Uh. <laughs> Give me that. That was brilliant. It was prose, but maybe whoo, stretch it out. What's going on here? You go up by like half a degree, you increase by a couple thousand. Okay, so very small temperature change results in a significant step up. Have you ever heard of a step function? Yeah. What does a step function do? Goes over and then up and then jumps, right? And that step function can be significant in sort of where those two steps are. So does this look like it might sort of be like a step function? Mm -hmm. So what does this operate like? This four degree ap operates like a, like a change point or a trigger. And so if the winter temperature is below four degree, we, it's cool winter, very few diplosoma. You almost can't find them the next year. If that preceding winter is over four degrees, they absolutely dominate. They're everywhere. And so less than a degree causes an absolute complete shift in the ecosystem. And what does diplosoma do? Colonial tunicate, it grows over everything. So it coats mussels, it coats algae, it coats whatever else is trying to grow. So is it great for the ecosystem? Probably not. So you end up with a system that's dominated by diplosoma, so that is called a mono, mono something, mono, monoculture. So one species dominates. Okay. And so what we see from this data and why it's why it's relevant. First, we have to acknowledge climate is changing, and carbon emissions are are playing a role, probably a significant role in that warming. This is the part where I tell you what I told you, just so we're all clear. A small difference in temperature may facilitate the establishment of non-native species into systems where they normally would not be successful. What does that mean? Somebody state that back to me. Okay, so they grow more where they shouldn't. So where they normally might get introduced, but they can't survive or they don't do well. 
a change in climate then facilitates them to, to grow and do well. So again, it's not that the climate brings them there, but once they're there, they're more successful. We should be doing all that we can to reduce our contributions to climate change. So trying to reduce your carbon footprint as much as you can, but also limit the opportunities for in space invasive species to spread. There's education campaigns about moving boats from one body of water into another to, to not uh, carry invasive species that way. Anyone try to take firewood into a different state? Don't try it, they'll get you. Right now there's limitations on transporting wood around like that ash borer. You could have ash borers in Connecticut and you say, well, let's go up to our cabin in New Hampshire. Let's, hey, we got wood in the backyard, let's bring it. You now transport that creature into New Hampshire and maybe introduce it into an area where it wasn't before. Okay, so we have to be careful and, and be aware of that. There's limitations on bait use, all kinds of things. And then one of the key points that's overlooked is the ongoing baseline data, this long-term data about ecosystems is so important so that we can look back and say, how are we changing ecosystems? What impact do we have? How are they shifting? And do we need to address those issues? Okay, and this, this baseline data at UConn was very important to being able to do that to pull off that climate pattern. So that's kind of the story that's in the paper, whether you recognize that or not. They grow faster when it's warmer. Their babies come out quicker when it's warmer. And so they recruit more when it's warmer. And so all those things contribute to diplosoma sort of dominating when the winter's not so cool. Any questions? Does it change your life? Yes? How come all the that graph you showed, like with the change in the average temperature, mm -hmm. how come there's not like any change in the summer temperatures but in the winter? It, it, it depends on how the, the the interaction in, in the water there, that's water just off the coast. And so interaction with precipitation, you mentioned that the rainfall might, might be important and the, the weather patterns there. And it could just be that the, the summer water, the way that uh, uh, Gulf Stream comes up the coast and transports water from farther south and all the mixing that goes on might stabilize the summer temperature where in the winter it's more susceptible to just what, what's the atmospheric or what's the air temperature doing. Um, I don't know enough about the interaction between the summer and the winter, but those kinds of factors probably play some role. Okay, so now what we are going to do, I'll give you a little second to stretch your legs. Um, but what we're going to do is we'll work in groups of two, one, two, three, 11. So we could do groups of, uh, let's see, let's do three groups of three and one group of two. And what you're going to do is Millstone, the, the power plant, nuclear power plant down in Milford. So this is the, the main um, section where the power plant is. They have intake pipes way offshore and they suck cold water in. And then what do they do with that cold water? They use it to cool the like, nuclear reactor. They use it to cool the nuclear reactor. So there's cooling towers and they basically swirl that water around the cooling tower. The water picks up heat from the cooling tower and then they get rid of the water. So where they get rid of the water is out of this little effluent pool. So this is hot water here, and then the hot water eventually leaves Millstone and goes out into the sound. So cool water comes in, cools the, the towers, and then leaves as, as a hot water effluent plume. So this area here is actually quite warm. There's tropical species that live in this big pool, tropical sponges, all kinds of tropical fish. It's its own little ecosystem here. But then the water leaves Long Island Sound and leaves out these areas here. This is a rocky coast in Milford. And so what I want you to do in your groups is to use this diagram to then design an experiment where you would utilize this system to test some of the things that I presented today. Okay? So you're off the, the nuclear power plant, out in your boat, you got your scuba gear on, you got some plates maybe, and now you're gonna test this story so that you can come visit me in the fall and say, no, you're, you're totally wrong, or yep, we supported it with this, okay? So I'm going to give you each a little packet. You can mark this up right on it. Thank you. Um, but you're going to design an experiment. What kinds of things do you need to pay attention to when you're designing an experiment? Variable. Variables. So what's one of the key things I presented as an important variable here that can change? Temperature. Temperature. What about controls? What kinds of things might you want to control as you're out there? Mm, okay, control for who we're counting. What else might we control? 
You could say all C squirts or just some. What other control things do you have to worry about? Outside, like influences. Okay, what might those be in the water? Weather. Weather. Pollution. Pollution. Be a little more specific. Hmm, Ponder, think of the controls. The controls are going to be important. So go ahead and go back to the uh, little station.